Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts, losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. We are going to have two podcasts this week. Why? Because we can. That's why. I knew that the conversation with David Silverman was not going to be a full 90-minute conversation. His time is at a premium. He was kind enough to give us about a third of that tonight. But... uh, Because we couldn't do a full show, I thought it would be great to go ahead and do one tonight. And then we'll, of course, have a full 90-minute show, maybe even longer show, tomorrow night. We're calling it Seize the Day. First, this will be the second time he's appeared on the show with me, and I'm privileged to have him. His name is David Silverman. He's an activist, originally from Massachusetts, and he is the current president of the American Atheists, and he joins me now. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me back on, Seth. You have been... A busy man. I saw you on Hannity. I've seen you on O'Reilly. I don't know how many times. And of course, you're hot off the heels of the Reason Rally. So do you have a life (laughs) at all? (laughs) Well, you know, this job really does envelop you. I I will say that it used to be that uh, I would have a job and then I would have this atheism hobby, this volunteerism. And and now it's just that the volunteerism has become my job and it's still my hobby. I have to go through effort to make sure that I have a life. Let me start right off the bat by jumping into your appearance on Sean Hannity. Now, you have a thing about you're not you don't mind going on the Fox network. You don't mind jumping into the hot seat, even though you know that Sean Hannity is largely going to take that sort of superior condescending tone and rarely let you finish a sentence. And there are many who say, well, why would you give Hannity the time of day? What are you doing on the Fox network? And so I'll ask that question to you. Why do it? Well, there's a few good reasons that people don't really uh, don't really see. So I'm, I'm happy that you asked that question. One of the reasons is that the other networks watch Fox News. The, the, the CNN, it's not like I'm choosing to go on Fox to the exclusion of CNN or NBC. The, I go where I'm invited. And I usually get invited to do those other networks after a Fox appearance. So like that, um, that Fox appearance on, on O'Reilly, when I got back from O'Reilly, I had a call from CNN and they did an immediate CNN belief blog on the whole thing. So it really does lead to other media appearances. The other reason I do it, two other reasons. First of all, I like to make them look like asses to their own audience. I do like that. Okay? <laughs> There's a sort of a uh, gratification in giving is. them enough rope to hang themselves. Is yeah, that the idea? You know what? When, when after Bill O'Reilly said religion is a philosophy and I'm a fascist, I had Christians calling me just to say, hey, Dave, and, and this happened six times. Six different Christians called me to say, I don't agree with you on God, but Christianity is a religion and you're not a fascist. So if I give them enough rope, they do hang themselves. I went on the Stuart Varney show and he made a joke about Madeline Murray O'Hare and her death. So he actually made fun of Madeline being murdered and dismembered along with her son and her granddaughter, who was raped first, and they were all piled into a shallow grave. It was that pathetic, and I let him do it. I let him do it because I wanted his own people to see who he is. And the third, and perhaps the most important reason that I go on these silly shows, is that our people, Seth, the typical atheist doesn't watch Hannity, doesn't watch O'Reilly ever, ever. And that's a bad thing 
because they need to know how bad these people are. They need to know what these people are saying. They need to know that these people are capable of making fun of dead people. These people need to know that they are capable of redefining the word religion so that they can have government support for it on an official level. That's what O'Reilly was doing. And that's what, you know, everybody says, Dave, you're so rough, you're so mean, you're so harsh. These people are rough and mean and harsh. And sometimes, I'll just say it, they're very un-American, they're very unpatriotic, and they will lie and cheat and steal, well, not steal, but they will lie sure. in order to get their way. And our people need to see that, and our people only watch those shows when our people are on those shows. And if you watch what I say on, e on O'Reilly and Hannity, I'm all about equality, equality, equality. And they are trying, desperately trying, to make themselves into a victim because we're making them obey the same laws that we want to obey. Sure, you're just obey. making a constitutional argument, and they frame it as those big bad atheists just want to steal all of our beloved traditions. And of course, that's not at all what you're trying to accomplish. Not at all. Uh, well, some of their beloved traditions, yes, some of their beloved traditions are unconstitutional. OK, some of their beloved traditions, like forcing all the kids to acknowledge God in school and the Pledge of Allegiance, some of the, the old traditions of just having uh, the December season be about Christmas, that's a Christian tradition, and I am attacking that. That tradition is against the American way. It's unequal, and some traditions are bad. And the ones that produce and defend inequality in a country that's supposed to have uh, you know, one nation for all, equal justice for all under the law, uh, that's not good. And that's what I'm attacking. See, the Christians have had themselves on a pedestal for so long that when we try to make them equal to everybody else, they see it as an attack. And I guess that's, I mean, it's analogous to a white person saying that civil rights was an attack against their rights. It's, a, it's analogous to a man saying that giving the women a right to vote was an attack against the man's right to only have men vote. It, it, it's that kind of mentality. We're taking away and fighting against an inequality that has a traditional base. Let me springboard off of a couple of things that you've said. When you were at the Oklahoma Free Thought Convention, you sort of led with a line that got everyone's attention. You said, hi, I'm David Silverman. And I am a dick. And, <laughs> and of course, you know, this probably speaks to uh, the confrontational activist part of you. You are kind of in people's face to a degree. But can you tell me where that comes from? Do you get that a lot? I do get that a lot. And I do understand it because I'm saying things that are politically incorrect. And that is because it is politically correct to kiss religion's butt. It is politically correct to give religion the respect that it demands. Notice how religion makes it politically incorrect to talk poorly or to criticize religion. Notice how it is suddenly politically incorrect to draw Muhammad's face. Why is it politically incorrect to draw Muhammad? Because the Muslims say, we don't want you to do it. So it becomes politically incorrect to do it, so all of a sudden, we're obeying Islamic law because they told us to. We're not going to obey religious law because they tell us to. If they tell us to not draw Muhammad, I'm drawing Muhammad because they told us not to. Now, does that make me a dick? No, it makes me a patriot. But they're going to call me a dick because they're saying that I'm doing something just to offend them. Nobody's actually thinking, hey, by the way, it's kind of offensive for you to tell me to obey your laws in the first place. Nobody's saying, hey, you know what? It's kind of offensive for you to tell me I can't draw this anymore. I can't say this anymore. The big com complaint about our billboards is what they say. I can't say religion is a myth. I can't say religion is a lie. It is a myth. It is a lie. And even and if it wasn't. It. Wouldn't, shouldn't you have the freedom to be able to express an idea? Why be so threatened by an idea that you can't even have it posted publicly somewhere? It and, boggles and, the mind. And that makes me a dick. 
And that's why, you know what? I'm embracing the word. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I totally embrace the word. If, if this makes me a dick, call me a dick. But I'm going to be the person who actually exercises my constitutional rights every time some religious group tells me I can't. Well, this speaks and to tactics can... now. I mean, you mentioned yeah. a guy that, who was speaking, someone, there was a speaker at one of the TAM meetings who was saying, don't be a dick, don't be a, t- abrasive, build bridges rather than burn them. And so in their mind, all of this confrontation is counterproductive. I, I disagree. Um, I, I think the, the, what we have to understand is that there's diver- diversity in the movement and there's diversity in tactics and it all has to happen. Um, a good example is uh, the recent CNN article on the apparent rift in atheism. There's a rift in atheism. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, they, the, the, the article said, hey, look at, Dave, look at the American atheists. They put up this big billboard in Times Square that reads, keep the merry, dump the myth. On the other hand, look at these nice guys over at the Harvard Humanists doing a food drive with this church. Well, that food drive and that church and that uh, the Harvard Humanists, they're not going to get that kind of press without the American Atheist billboard to counter it. So it, it, it's it's about diversity in method, and it all works as a, as we work together. I'm going to do what I feel is right. I'm going to stand up for my rights, and I'm go and American atheist is going to be the one that says, "Get your religion out of my kid's face, get your hands out of my wallet, and if you tell me not to do something, I'm going to do just that." just because I want to make sure that my right to do that doesn't evaporate in political correctness. And if they're going to come back and say, hey, you know what, we want to build bridges, they can do that, and we will bring people in, and we will bring notice to the movement, and they can see that the AHA is doing these wonderful things to build bridges with the the religious community. Tell me about the uh, the lawsuit involving Uh churches and the IRS. Can you explain Uh that? This isn't, this isn't, as I understand it, an effort to make them pay. This is more about equality and transparency. Is that correct? It's 100 percent equality and transparency. But I, I, I have to tell you, uh, this is this is a, a, a very big, epically important lawsuit. And we at American Atheists, we file lawsuits that are smart. We file lawsuits that are timed. We file lawsuits that are strategic. And what we've got is we filed a lawsuit with three with three different plaintiffs, ourselves, a 501c3 educational organization that obeys the law, another 501c3 educational organization that disobeys the law and refused to file an I-990, and another 501c3, or I should say another atheist organization that was told that it can't be a religious organization because they're atheistic. Now, here's the lawsuit. We are not trying to tax the churches. What we are trying to do is get the churches to file the same paperwork as everyone else. A lot of people say, well, 501c3s are 501c3s. That is incorrect. 501c3s are 501c3s. Everybody has to file an I-990, which declares their income, and it declares their donors, and it declares how much money they're spending and how they're doing it. Every 501c3 has to do that unless it's religious. If it's a religious organization, it does not have to declare its income. It does not have to declare how much money it's paying its staff. It does not have to declare its donors. Now, think about that for a second. My salary is public knowledge. Pat Robertson's is not. American Atheist income is public knowledge, and how we spend our money is public knowledge, and how much we give to society is public knowledge. But the 700 Club is not. Totally private. Where 501c3s, and the only reason they don't have to file those that information, the only reason is that they are religious and we are not. And that's unfair. We spend about 200 hours every year putting together these five, these I-990s, and it's our responsibility to do it. We have to, by law. Churches don't have to, by law. And that's illegal. 
We are not placing an undue burden on the churches. Everybody, you know, because we're expecting that. They're going to say, you're placing an undue burden on us. No, we're placing the same burden on churches, big and small, that we're placing on every little tiny and great big 501c3 in the country. File your paperwork. And they're going to hate it. They're going to hate it. <laughs> yeah. because I'm sure the have, pushback is going to be unbelievable. They're going to cry be, foul and victim and everything else. And, and what are they going to say, though? What are they going to say? We don't want to tell you how much we're making. There's no undue burden here. There's no. There's nothing that we're forcing the churches to do that everybody else isn't doing. And the cat and the, and the the parishioners are going to learn to like this because. They need to know what those other churches are making. Don't you want to know the gross income for the Church of Scientology? Absolutely. I, I do. Absolutely. Yeah. And how do they spend their money? And how much money do their people pay? Because they're not paying any taxes. Don't you think we need to know how much money the Mormon church brings in and how much money they're paying their preachers and their bishops? I want to know. And how much money they're paying for, for to defeat things like Proposition 8? That's not public knowledge. If it was American atheists doing that, it would be public knowledge. But because the Church of Mormon does not is a religious organization, they have secrecy. And I'll tell you something else. Article 6 of the Constitution is called the No Religious Test Clause. It says there will be no religious tests for any public office or public trust. A 501c3, Seth, is a public trust. It is a company that is owned entirely by the United States government. We are arms of the government. That's why we don't pay taxes. If they impose a religious test, if they say, if you just by having, just by having a religious classification, they're imposing a religious test. So these guys, the, the IRS is breaking Article 6 of the Constitution. They're breaking the First Amendment by preferring religion over non-religion. And they're breaking uh, the Fifth Amendment due process which is there basically because that's how we translate the 14th Amendment to the to the federal government. The 14th Amendment, equal access, or I should say equal protection. It guarantees every citizen of this country to be treated equally regardless of religious belief or anything else. And guess what? Corporations are people now. This will be an interesting one to watch from the sidelines. I have a feeling it, we may be seeing you back in the news oh, it is, it <laughs> on this particular so issue. Solid. It is so solid. It is so rock solid. We um, we are very, very happy because this will allow us to remove the prejudice, to remove the inequality from the tax system so that we can be treated just like the religious organizations. Now, if the government decides, OK, all 501c3s don't have to file I-990s, well, that's fine. That's irresponsible, in my personal opinion, but that's legal. But what they will probably do is say, is, and what they really should do is say, okay, all, five, all churches are now 501c3 organizations just like everyone else. File your forms. Yeah. The end. I, uh, I know I've got you for only about uh, 15 more minutes. Let me move on very quickly. I was, uh, I was glad to be able to help out by producing the the video promo for the up and coming 50 year anniversary national convention for American atheists. I'm excited. It's going to be an amazing weekend coming up and we'll talk more about that. But I, I have to admit to you that as I was putting together the piece and we have the soundbite at the beginning with Madeline Murray O'Hare, such a polarizing controversial figure. And of course I became aware of her back when I was a believer, right? A an often acerbic, confrontational, I don't know, would you say, some people say hateful. I mean, can you talk to me a little bit about Madeline Murray O'Hare and, and your take on her? I never met her, okay? Um, and I wish I had. Madeline, as far as I can tell, she was a human, okay? And she had her pluses and her minuses. Uh, she was a hero. She fought for everybody's individual rights to her detriment, she uh, was arrested several times, harassed regularly, and in the end murdered with her son and her granddaughter. She fought for equality. She fought for our rights. And she did so with a sharp tongue. 
sometimes she said some things that I don't agree with. And there's, there's absolutely no question about that. Something that we have to understand is that heroes are heroes, but that doesn't make them perfect. She made mistakes. And she said some things that I really don't agree with and in a method that I really don't agree with. But that's because we live in the 2010s and she was doing all of this in the 60s and 70s. And I think in the 60s and 70s, she was really perfect for what she was doing. I think as time went on, maybe she stayed a little too acidic and she created some division, or I should say division was created around her because of her personality. That really kind of hurt the movement that she really kickstarted. Well, I kind of uh, jumped into, uh, you know, it's funny because looking, watching some of the interviews and some of the work that she had done after the fact, I, I really do admire her. I admire the work that she did. She put herself on the line and paid the ultimate penalty. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I really do think this was groundbreaking work. But it's she's such a polarizing figure, and I know she's sort of sort of the one of the the cornerstones of the organization. I wondered if that's a discussion that had been had by someone else, or if I was the only one. You know, no, no, no. People understand who she was and what she was, and I think what everybody needs to understand is that she did start this movement. She did start kickstart the equal rights for atheists movement, and she deserves that credit. She deserves to be remembered that way because it was such a heroic thing for her to do. We're not in a position to deny some of the less popular things she said and did, but I am in a position, and we're all in a position, we're all in the position that we are right now because of Madeline, because she was the first one to stand up in front of the Supreme Court as an atheist and say, hey, you're pushing your religion on my kid and my rights as an atheist are being infringed. She was the first person to do that. And it took real guts. Yeah. And and I think she needs to be remembered for that. Um, yeah, she had her rough spots. But you know what? I got my rough spots too. And I hope when I'm done, when I'm gone, when I'm dead and buried, uh, people remember my uh, – my good stuff and not so much my bad stuff. Yeah, I think we're all that way. Yeah. On uh, March the 28th, we kick off the 50-year anniversary of the American Atheist with the National Convention. Now, you're hot off the heels of the Reason Rally last year, which was mm -hmm. a life changer for a great many of us. Uh, I'm amazed you were able to pull it off. I don't know what the logistics are of getting the, the National Mall and, and putting something of that magnitude together, but kudos I, to you. Wow. Thank you very much. That was um, the most I've ever worked in my life uh, by far. It was it was a, an immense amount of work, but I had a lot of help um, from the from the other organizations. Um, the the magic behind the Reason Rally, and and so many people talk about it being a life changing event, and it was, but it was also a movement changing event because it was the first time that everybody on a national level, all the organizations, got together put money in the pot, stood behind one, one front man, one point person, and created an epic event and did so exceedingly well. The, it, it wasn't about David Silverman making the Reason Rally. It was about American atheists working with FFRF, working with CSH and CFI, working with AHA and Atheist Alliance to put together an event that represented the entire movement and brought 30,000 atheists into the one place at one time with great big smiles on their faces. It, it, it made us aware that we could do it, and it made the members aware that we could do it. It raised the awareness that when the movement works united, we can achieve spectacular things. And you were oh. expecting sort of another history-making event as we approached Happy birthday, number 50, for the American Atheist here coming up. This is going to be quite possibly the biggest convention in your history. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to uh, do that. We've already, and this is something, uh, and you know what, I'm just going to say right out here that I'm sorry, but the, the, the first hotel is already sold out. And this is like, I mean, we our entire block that we put up, that we put together, was as big as last year's block by and increased it by 20%, and it's already sold out. We're already in an overflow hotel, okay? Um, 
And it, it's just going to be a fantastic convention. And the reason, Seth, and I want this you know, you know, I can go over the line of speakers. We've got Catherine Stewart. We've got uh, Janet Heimlich, A.C. Grayling coming. Congressman Pete Stark is coming. J.J. French, the lead guitarist from Twisted Sister, is coming. This is going to be a fantastic lineup, but that's not it. That's not all of it. The important thing to remember about American Atheist Conventions is that the person who was running them, me, used to go to these conventions and skip all the talks. I used to skip the talks when I went to these conventions because I was going for the fun. I was going for the socialization. And now I'm running these conventions and our conventions are fun. We're going to have live music. We're going to have a band. We're going to have a comedy night. We're going to have a, uh, our third annual costume dinner. We're going to have a body painter. We're going to have a sketch artist. We're going to have a fun time. Our intention for putting this convention together, yes, it's our 50th anniversary. Yes, we expect to get between, between 1,200 and 1,500 atheists in one place, and that's going to be great. But it is going to be electric. It's going to be the kind of convention that you don't forget. I remember there was this one convention that I went back to back in 2007, uh, the, the, the Four Horsemen Convention that was put together then by Atheist Alliance International. This is a, back in 2007. I had a blast at that convention, and I remember it clearly. I want our conventions, I want American Atheist Conventions to be the convention that you go to and remember and have fun. Last year, we were bigger than TAM. The buzz around this is huge, and we've already sold out our first hotel. How do you maintain this level of intensity? Uh, it's are you do you just are you one hundred and fifty percent all day, and then at like eleven o'clock at night you just collapse? Yes, <laughs> yes. Know, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go face first down into the pillow, and then I crash, uh, and then it's all over. I um I, I've always been a pretty energetic person, but. But this movement energizes me. Well, it this helps when movement. you're passionate, I think. You know, uh, it's obvious you're passionate about free thought, about about people who are living deity-free lives. And I think you're helping people to see a life without a, a mythology guiding you is really a joyous life. It's a liberated life. It's a happy and wonderful and exciting and fun life. And I think you're able to sort of provide that example. I'm like a kid in a candy store, Seth. I am, I am living the dream. I am being paid to be a professional atheist activist. <laughs> I mean, this, this is this is fantastic, and, and um, I think uh, the movement is really gelling. There's a lot of things happening in the movement. Uh, there's a there's there's a, a few announcements coming from American atheists uh, that are coming down the pike real soon. Um, and I don't know if we're going to make an announcement before the convention or at the convention, um, but it's going to be you know it, it's growth. It's good. And uh, it's, it's, it's very exciting um, to be a part of this. This is, um, the, I, I think the, 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 the crux of my excitement comes from the fact that I've been an activist for 15 years, and now we're seeing it happen. Now we're seeing the growth. Now we're seeing the acceptance. Now we're seeing the success. By the time I'm an old, retired guy, we're going to have won this battle. Really. We're really going to win in the next 20 years. America is becoming less bigoted and more secular every day. Every time Bill O'Reilly calls me a fascist, every time Sean Hannity calls me a narcissist because they have no other thing to say, every time they scream at me, every time they make fun of Madeline Murray O'Hare dying, it's desperation, Seth. Yeah. And they know it. Well, I want to thank you because every time you go on O'Reilly, a new internet meme is born. <laughs> the tide goes in is is going to be around for another decade. They call it the Silverman meme. That look on your face is, yep. is Bill O'Reilly's. I mean, it's just one of those frozen moments in time that is absolutely priceless. So and, I don't know. And, and I love that. I yeah. love that meme. 
David Silverman, by the way, you can go to atheist.org to find out more about the convention. Even though the hotels are booking up, there is still room, yes? Yes, yes, yes. We still have room for the convention, uh, but you're going to be in an overflow hotel, and we will have a free shuttle going back and forth to make it nice and easy. And it's going to be worth it. It's going to be an amazing weekend. And David Silverman, thanks for all the wonderful work you do, and we'll see you in March for the 50-year anniversary of the American Atheists. Thank you, Seth, and thank you for all of the work you do and all of the work that you did for the Reason Rally and for this American Atheist Convention. I really appreciate it. A real pleasure. Thank all you, right. Dad. Take care now. Join me tomorrow night. We're going to have kind of an introspective and reflective kind of a show. Now, I know I'm kind of a sappy guy, but I just felt like as we kick off the year, it'd be nice to talk about some of the good stuff, some of the things that make a non-religious life amazing. And really the best kind of life to live. Your stories, your calls, your emails. I'll see you tomorrow night for another thrill-packed edition of the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com